Welcome once again to our introductory lecture series on the Divine Principle. I'm Reverend Philip Shanker. As we explained previously, the principle is not the product of philosophical inquiry or uh, academic research. It is revealed knowledge conveyed for people of the 21st century in a logical and systematic way uh, for those of us who often face a contradiction between faith and reason. In the same way that a doctor cannot identify a disease or prescribe a cure unless he first studies anatomy, the original design and function of how a body is ideally meant to work, in the same way as an electrician cannot identify a problem in the wiring of a building unless he first looks at the blueprint. Likewise, we began with a blueprint for the purpose and meaning of life, the principle of creation, the nature of God, the principles of the created world, the purpose and value of human life, the meaning of the three blessings, the relationship between our spiritual and physical selves, how our spirit is meant to grow on the foundation of our physical body, and thus the value of physical life. Next, we considered, based on that blueprint, what went wrong. The human fall and gained deeper insight into the contradiction that arose in human beings and why the world became itself a world of corruption and evil and depravity and why this contradiction exists throughout human history. Based on these insights, we took a fresh look at the purpose of the Messiah, the life of Jesus, the mission of John the Baptist, the meaning of the cross, the extent of salvation through it. We also considered a number of traditional concepts of our faith, the meaning of the last days and the destruction of the world. Today, in our fifth presentation, we're going to address the concept of the resurrection of the dead, another doctrine of our traditional faith. And from the advantage of the perspectives of the principle, we'll gain new insight into this topic. Let's begin. Let us discuss the principle of resurrection. If we are to believe literally the prophecies of Scripture, we should expect that when Jesus comes again, the deceased saints will come back to life in the flesh, as recorded in the Scripture. Their bodies, buried in the earth and completely decomposed, will be reconstituted to their original state. Now, this is a challenge for any 21st century believer, because you can consider some of those saints have been passed away for 2,000 years. Their bodies decomposed, eaten by worms, the worms eaten by fish, the fish by bigger fish, traveling throughout the oceans, becoming part of, of uh, materials and chemicals and perhaps part of uh, this microphone or this controller. And so the idea that these decomposed bodies would completely reconstitute is a tremendous challenge, and yet it's a doctrine of our faith. Given the modern state of our knowledge, these prophecies do not make rational sense. This brings, therefore, confusion to the Christian faith. Believers are forced to once again stand in contradiction to logic and reason, and we tell our children then that they should believe just by faith, just by doctrine, just by tradition. Therefore, it's important that we gain new insight. We elucidate the true meaning. Now, given the modern state of our knowledge, these prophecies do not make rational sense, and therefore, once again, believers are forced to stand against reason in order to affirm our faith. And we have to tell our children to believe by doctrine, to believe just by blind faith. Therefore, it's important that we elucidate the true meaning of resurrection more fully. Now, by doing this, are we seeking to water down our faith? to make things worldly and materialistic and easy and, and, and just logical and having no power? Absolutely not. You will see that through the divine principle, a deeper insight into these traditional doctrines helps us to empower our faith, challenges us to live a deeper and more meaningful life of faith. Let's begin. The meaning of resurrection. Now, the word literally means to rise again. And resurrection, therefore, means to come back to life. To come back to life, of course, implies that we have been dead. 
Therefore, to fathom the meaning of resurrection, first we need to clarify the meaning of life and death in the biblical sense, the biblical concepts of life and death. Now, this is not easy, for Jesus said, for example, whoever seeks to gain his life will lose it, and whoever is willing to lose his life will find it. So there are clearly two concepts of life and death in the Scripture. Let's consider Luke 9.60, for example. When a follower asked Jesus if he could go home to bury his father who had passed away, Jesus said, leave the dead to bury their own dead. Now, from these words, it's clear that the Bible contains two distinctly different concepts of life and death. The first, death meaning the end of physical life, as was the case with the disciple's deceased father who was being buried. But now, what about those who were going to do the burying of that disciple's father? Were they also physically dead people? Were they, had, had their uh, physiological functions ceased? And the life from which that death took place means the state in which the physical self is maintaining its physiological functions. But now, what about the dead who were going to be burying the disciple's father? Were they too physically dead people? Were they going to climb out of their graves and welcome him like a party? No, let's consider this second concept of life and death. The second concept of life and death concerns those living people who had gathered to bury the deceased man. The death in this sense refers to those who have left the bosom of God's love, who've been alienated, who are not following God, who are not coming to Jesus, falling under the dominion of Satan. And the life from which they passed the corresponding concept of life refers to spiritual life, the state of living in accordance with God's will, within the dominion of God's infinite love. Jesus said, leave the dead, come to life, come follow me, leave those behind who are not following me. And Jesus referred to them as dead. Now, a similar conclusion can be drawn from other biblical passages. There are other places in Scripture where Jesus referred to people who were physically alive Yet he called them dead. For example, in Revelation 3.1, Jesus is addressing an unrighteous Christian church who has been, that has been living outside of the standard of faith. And he says, I know your works. You have the name of being alive, but you are dead. So by evaluating how they were living, even though they were physically alive, Jesus called them dead. Now, conversely, Jesus also refers to people in Scripture who are physically dead and says they're alive. For example, John eleven twenty five: 25, He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. So Jesus is saying you will die. The person who believes in me will taste death in the physical sense, but still will be alive. Jesus meant that even after their physical bodies return to the soil, their spirits will enjoy life in God's dominion. And Jesus went on to say in the next verse, John eleven twenty six, 26, whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Now, does that mean that they won't taste physical death? No, he just said, though he die, a believer will live. But yet, even though he will taste physical death, in another sense, he will never die. By this, Jesus meant that those who believe in him during their earthly life will be alive, both in this life and in the next. So now, the important question is the death caused by the fall. Which of these two biblical concepts of death refers to the death brought about by the fall of the first human ancestors? The Bible says, in the day you eat of that fruit, in that day you will die. Well, Adam and Eve did not die on the day that they committed the original sin. They continued to live their life for many years. So it would seem to suggest that the death that came by the fall was not a physical death. However, there are those who say, well, it was the eating of the fruit that caused them to now begin to decompose. Otherwise, their physical bodies would have lived forever. There are others who say, well, the Bible says that with God, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. So if they didn't live a thousand years, they did die in that day. But in fact, the principle of creation gives us more insight. 
According to the principle of creation, God created human beings to grow old and ultimately return to the dust. Physical death was allotted to human beings regardless of whether or not they fell. Our physical bodies are made of the same material, the same stuff, the same cells, the same flesh as the flesh of animals and the material of the creation. Animals in the creation did not commit sin. But their material selves are corruptible, as is human flesh. Human flesh is not meant to be of a different degree or different nature than other material parts of the creation. This is clear according to the principle of creation. Only the spirit self enters the spirit world and lives there for eternity. So the death caused by the fall does not mean the end of our physiological functions, the ceasing of our physical life, but rather our separation from the love and life of God, our descent into the evil dominion of Satan through the eating of the fruit. Now, in fact, at the time of creation, Genesis says that God raised man from the dust of the earth, which means our physical bodies are formed from the material elements of the natural world. And then that God breathed in the breath of life and man became a living soul. So from the time of our creation, we were given both a physical and a spiritual self. The spiritual self is not something we're given after we die to experience eternal life. And the physical self is not meant to live for eternity. Here, Ecclesiastes says, Then shall the dust, the body, return to the earth as it was and the spirit shall return to God who gave it. Likewise, Paul described the significance of the resurrection as not physical in nature, but spiritual. He said there are celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, heavenly and earthly. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. They're distinctly different. So also, he wrote, is the resurrection of the dead. This in the first letter of Corinthians, the 15th chapter. He described, it is sown a physical body, a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural or physical body, and there is a spiritual body, two selves, as we learned in the principle of creation. And Paul went on to say that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That eternal realm is meant for the spirit, not the flesh. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Now, in this sense, when Jesus is speaking of corruption, he's not talking about evil or badness. He's talking about that which corrodes, breaks down, and falls apart. I'm sorry, Paul, when Paul is writing this, that which breaks down, falls apart like the material world. So flesh and blood are not to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, we can consider the meaning of resurrection. Resurrection is defined as the process of being restored from the death caused by the fall to life, from the realm of Satan's dominion to the realm of God's dominion. Now, if the death that came about as a result of the fall was not a physical death, then the resurrection to life that we need in order to fulfill the purpose of God's plan of restoring us is not a physical resurrection. Let's consider. Whenever we repent of our sins and rise to a higher state of goodness, then we are resurrected to that degree. In other words, as we develop our relationship with God, come closer to Him, separate ourselves from Satan, have give and take with God's love and God's Word, then our spirit resurrects. So resurrection is not an instantaneous transformation, but it's a lifelong process. In fact, we'll see it's a history-long process. So let's review for a moment the biblical meaning of spiritual death and spiritual life. Again in 1 Corinthians, as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. From Romans, the fifth chapter, by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned. It's what we inherited, this spiritual reality of death. Romans 6, for the wages of sin is death. Romans 8, to set the mind on the flesh, on the worldly, the self-centered, the physical, 
the momentary, the, the self-satisfying is death. But to set the mind on the spirit, the eternal, the lasting, is life and peace. Perhaps the best description that I've seen in the Bible is Ephesians 4, verse 18. Speaking of those who are spiritually dead, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Ignorance spiritually of God's truth. Separation from His love due to hardened hearts. And so darkened in their understanding. Separated from the life of God. Conversely, then, what's the meaning of resurrection in the Bible? It, the, the, to, to come to life is a process that takes place through the Word. Here, 1 John Chapter 3, verse 14, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. So here, godly love brings us to life. Coming back to the love of God brings us to life. And also in the fifth chapter of the Gospel of John, he who hears my word, said Jesus, and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. So it's the love of God and it's the truth of God that brings us to spiritual life. It's the process of our spiritual resurrection. Well, let's consider then what changes does resurrection cause in human beings? Adam and Eve died when they ate that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But nevertheless, no significant external change took place in them when they committed the sin and became evil. In other words, there was no change of altitude, for example. Adam and Eve were not created up in the sky. The fall did not bring them down to the earth in a physical sense. And so resurrection, first of all, is not a process of us going back up to a place upstairs. Going to the roof of this building will not make me closer to God. Likewise, there was no dramatic external transformation as a result of the fall. It was an internal transformation. Likewise, no significant external changes should be expected to take place in fallen people when they are resurrected to the state prior to the fall. Consider Jesus. Now, if we believe the Hollywood image from old Hollywood movies about the life of Jesus Christ, a blonde, blue-eyed Jesus would walk everywhere with lambs and children, and everyone who saw him would be awed and amazed and fall to their knees and want to follow him. But in fact, if Jesus was so obviously spiritual, so obviously recognizably different, then the Jewish people who were waiting for the Messiah would have followed him. In fact, there he stood prior to his going to the cross. And Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, stood up Jesus and a common criminal, a murderer, a thief, Barabbas, and gave the people a chance to let one of them go and put one of them to death. They freed Barabbas, the murderer and the criminal, and put Jesus to death. So Jesus didn't externally appear in any dramatic, brilliant way. However, the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration, when their spiritual eyes opened, and they saw Moses and Elijah from the spiritual realm suddenly there talking with Jesus. At the same time, Jesus was transformed in front of them. And his spirit, which they could now see, was radiant, brilliant, and white. But from an external standpoint, to those of us looking at the physical self, there's no external change that can be expected through the process of a person being resurrected. So the changes a person experiences when he or she is resurrected and enters the governance of God, take place in the heart and the spirit. But these internal changes do impact the body. A pure spirit purifies the body, transforming it from a haunt of Satan into a temple of God. That's why a good and godly spiritual life will impact health and other aspects of our physical experience. So now, with a clearer understanding of the meaning of resurrection, let's now look at the providence by which God has been working to accomplish it. How does God carry out His work of resurrection? Resurrection is the process through which a fallen person is restored to the original state as intended by God. In other words, 
as we develop our relationship with God, receive more love, connect to greater truth, our spirit benefits and lifts up and grows closer to its original goal and purpose. It resurrects. So Adam and Eve, who fell and established a fallen world outside of the principle, in the process of humanity being resurrected or restored, we also are being resurrected. So the process of resurrection is synonymous with the process of restoration. As we restore our relationship with God, separate from Satan, we benefit spiritually to that degree. And since that process is a recreation, we are coming back to spiritual life in the same way as we were meant to originally grow spiritually, then the providence of resurrection is carried out in accordance with the principle of creation. According to the principle of creation, human beings are meant to grow spiritually on the foundation of a physical body. First, by receiving God's word, we can, we can grow spiritually. Then by putting that into practice in our physical life, we can build it as one of our habits, part of our character, part of our nature. Or as James wrote, faith without works is dead. So we need these elements, both of the love and truth from God and also a good physical life in order to grow spiritually. Now there are four principles that govern the process of resurrection and its historical accomplishment that are all based upon the principle of creation. Let's look at these four principles. The first is the merit of the age. The merit of the age has increased in proportion to the foundation of heart laid by the prophets sages and righteous people who came before us. Please think. We stand on the foundation of our ancestors. How could we even be discussing these things here? We go back to the earliest ages of human history. In the age from Adam until Abraham, there was no word of God, no Ten Commandments, no laws, no standard. But human beings related to God through offerings and sincerity. But on that successful foundation, up until Abraham, God sent Moses and gave the Ten Commandments and the law. Now, the people of Israel had a standard of judgment by which to relate to God. And they were justified by their obedience to the law. And they could resurrect themselves to that degree. On that foundation, Jesus came. He brought a new gospel and con conveyed and revealed a God of love. By his death and resurrection, Jesus opened up a providence where we could be resurrected by grace. We could be saved spiritually by God's grace through the condition of our faith and dwell in a better place as a result of our relationship with Jesus. On that foundation of the New Testament era, we stand today preparing to understand these things and go to the next step. So we stand on the foundation of heart laid by the faithful of earlier ages. This broadens the foundation upon which subsequent generations can form a relationship of heart with God. Let's look at the second principle of resurrection. God's responsibility is to give us His word and His guidance. And our responsibility is to believe and practice it to fulfill His providence. In other words, just as by the principle of creation, man grows spiritually by hearing and practicing the Word of God. Also, the degree of resurrection possible in a particular age is based upon the level of truth that a human being can understand and practice. Thirdly, the, the resurrection of a spirit can be achieved only through earthly life. A person's spirit can grow to perfection only through the physical self. Now, in the principle of creation, we came to understand that the spirit, the relationship between the spirit and the physical self is like a fruit to the vine. Just like the fruit is nourished through the vine, our physical, spiritual, our, our spiritual self is nurtured through the foundation of a physical life. It's the reason we live for 80 years on this earth, to grow and develop our heart, to be harvested as a son or daughter of God. Likewise, in the providence of resurrection, the elevation of human beings spiritually takes place on the earth. 
centered on those who have physical bodies. God has sent prophets where? To the earth. God sent the Messiah where? To the earth. The focus of God's providence is on the earth because it's in our physical lifetime that we can actually resurrect spiritually. Now the fourth principle of the providence of resurrection is that that providence is to be completed through three stages ordered stages, manifested as three ages in the providence of restoration. So in the same way as human beings were originally meant to grow to maturity through three distinct stages in one lifetime, since the fall, the entire process of human history has been the struggle to resurrect man back to the level that should have been realized in Adam's lifetime. And that historical process has taken place through three stages of growth manifested as three ages in the providence of restoration. So let's look at that providence. The providence of resurrection for people who have been alive on the earth. First, the 2,000 years from Adam to Abraham can be called the age of the providence to lay the foundation for resurrection. From the moment Adam fell, God began his work of restoration in the family of Adam. However, because of failure, because of falling short, God's will was frustrated and prolonged from Adam's family, ten generations to Noah's family, and ten generations to Abraham's family. On Abraham's successful foundation, his family's successful foundation, God could raise a later age. Now during those 2000, that 2,000 year period from Adam to Abraham, you'll notice there was no gospel, there was no Ten Commandments or law. The reason is because human beings had fallen to a place so low, outside the realm of the principle, human beings had no foundation to receive the word. The Bible says that man's heart had become deceitful above everything else. So now, at a position too low to be able to understand and receive God's word, how did human beings relate to God? Through offerings. We offered the best of our crop the best of our flock. Man came to God through a mediator, the natural world, the creation, animals or crops. Why? Because the creation which had not fallen was in fact more pure than human beings who had fallen. And so man offered himself to God symbolically through the things of creation. Now when you look at this early 2000 years, the age of offerings, most probably the time from Adam the first human ancestor, and Abraham being identified in recorded history was most probably much more than a literal 2,000 years. But the Bible measures it specifically as 2,000 years, setting a pattern for the successive ages that followed, each one being 2,000 years in length. Now, the 2,000 years from Abraham to Jesus, the next age, can be called the age of formation stage resurrection. In this age, man was justified by works. In this age, God did give his word. On the foundation of Abraham, God sent Moses with ten clear commandments, a standard by which to relate to God and how to treat our fellow man, and 613 specific laws. The believers of this era, who practiced the law in their daily lives, resurrected in spirit to the formation stage. Upon their death, the believers of this era entered and abided in the formation stage or form spirit stage of the spirit world. So the purpose of the Old Testament was that individuals could resurrect according to the standard of the law and become servants of God to fear the Lord, to honor the commandment, to fulfill by duty and obligation according to the law. That was the spirit of the Old Testament. Now, the 2,000 years from Jesus until the returning Christ can be called the providence of growth stage resurrection. In this age, after the death and resurrection of Jesus, believers were justified not by obedience to the law, but by faith in the crucified and resurrected Jesus. You can see that those living in this era were able to be resurrected to the growth stage in spirit by believing in the gospel that they could be justified by their faith in Jesus who had opened up a new realm of resurrection through his victory over death, his victory over evil and, and over resentment and pain. 
upon their death, the believers of this era could enter and abide in paradise, which is the life spirit level of the spirit world. Paradise is that realm open to faithful believers who have been resurrected through faith in Christ, who overcame death and brought spiritual salvation. Jesus said to the thief on his right hand side, you will be with me this day in paradise. Now some believe that those who passed away as faithful Christians go automatically to the realm of the kingdom of heaven. But the Bible says clearly in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians the fourth chapter, that the dead in Christ sleep. And that when Christ returns and opens up a new realm of resurrection, that those who are dead in Christ will be the first to rise, the first to resurrect. Now, the era when people complete the providence of resurrection through the returning Christ is called the age of the providence of completion stage resurrection. Now, it's an age where we're justified not by obeying the law, uh, which was the Old Testament age, not by simple faith in a crucified and resurrected Jesus who is the true Son, and by Him we can be adopted. This is an age when all of us are meant to grow to the full measure of the stature of Christ, as Ephesians describes, to become true sons and true daughters of God. By believing in and serving the returning Christ, then people of this era can resurrect both spiritually and physically, becoming divine spirits, and live in the kingdom of heaven on earth. This is what John meant in the first letter of John, chapter 3, verse 4, when John said, Brethren, we do not yet know what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That when he comes, we are to become like him, in every way. It's the same reason why Paul wrote in Ephesians 4 verses 12 and 13 that the purpose of the church and all the gifts and all the works of prophecy or healing or, or teaching or preaching are all for the perfecting of the saints till we all reach the full measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ unto a perfect man. We are all to reach the fullness of Christ a perfect man. This is the meaning of the potential of resurrection in this era, that we all become divine spirits. Upon their death, the believers in this, uh, of this era will enter and abide in the kingdom of heaven in the spiritual world that is the divine spirit level of that realm. Now, let's consider the providence of resurrection for those who passed away already in the past, for those who are in spirit. First, the purpose and the way of returning resurrection. The spirits of people who died before they could reach perfection during their earthly life can be resurrected only by returning to earth and completing their unaccomplished responsibility by cooperating with earthly people. Now, to some believers, this is a surprising concept. But for many who have spiritual sensibility, they're quite aware, as Scripture says, that we are surrounded even now by so great a cloud of witnesses. Some believe that the Bible denies or rejects the idea that there is a spiritual realm, that there's just God and Satan and the Holy Spirit. But in fact, what the Bible proscribes, speaks against, is worship of the dead that we shouldn't seek guidance from the spirits to guide us in our life. But in fact, the scripture from beginning to end affirms that there is a spiritual realm that's relating with the earth. Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17, Moses and Elijah, long passed away, appeared to him. Jesus said that in Mark that, that uh, uh, the scripture says that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and criticizing the Sadducees who denied that there was life after death, he said, you're wrong. He said, God is not a God of the dead. He's a God of the living, meaning Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive. Jesus spoke the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, 
Lazarus, about the, the, the rich man having passed away, wanted to communicate, let his relatives know on earth, wanted to reach back to the physical world, relate with them, and benefit from what was going on on the earth. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, I know a man in Christ who was caught up to the third heaven. Whether he was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. Only God knows. So actually, Jesus also, he healed by casting out demons. He spoke of good spirits and evil spirits, as do many parts of Scripture. So there is a spiritual realm. We are not to worship it, but definitely that spiritual world is connected with and working with the events of the earth because the earth is the stage upon which God's providence is being done. By assisting people of faith, living on the earth to fulfill their missions, the spirits also can complete their mission at the same time. Now, how do spirits help people on earth? These spirits will descend to receptive people, form a common base with their spirit selves, and work with them. Let's consider. We call this process returning resurrection. Now, let's first consider the returning resurrection for all those who lived according to God's providence in the Old and New Testaments, the Israelite and Christian spiritual realm. After the advent of Jesus, the form spirits of the Old Testament age returned to the earth, assisted faithful people on earth to attain the level of life spirit. This is the reason why Moses and Elijah appeared. But furthermore, Matthew 27 describes more phenomena. It says that after the resurrection of Jesus, the veil of the temple was torn in two. A new realm was opened for resurrection. And the Bible says that many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of their tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now, some have described this as a literal phenomenon, that actually physical bodies of flesh came out of the graves after hundreds of years and walked around. But certainly, if Moses and Elijah and, and, and Jeremiah and the great saints and prophets of old were alive and walking around, the Jewish people would have been moved. You at least would have read something about it. Yet, there's only this vague reference in this one location to these, the, the, these bodies of the saints appearing to many, not to everyone. Everyone didn't see it. Only some people saw it. It was an apparition. It was, in fact, spiritual phenomenon. Now, by this, by cooperating with earthly believers who were attending Jesus, participating in the New Age, then these spiritual beings, too, could receive the same benefit. They could become life spirits and enter paradise. We call this process of assistance and support between spirit, spiritual and physical worlds and gaining the benefit of resurrection. This is growth stage resurrection. Now, as a result, consider the believers in Jesus who prior to his death and resurrection, his own disciples were faithless and afraid and tried to walk on water and couldn't and tried to heal and couldn't and didn't understand him and he got frustrated. You faithful and perverse generation, how long must I be with you? And still you don't know me. But after the resurrection, the descent of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and healing and empowered and preaching and converting thousands, they were more powerful than Jesus had been because of the strong support of the spiritual realm. Now, after the second advent, the life spirits of the New Testament age will all return to the earth to help faithful people on earth to attain the level of divine spirit. They will accomplish it in the same way, by cooperating with earthly people. And they too will receive the same benefit and enter the heavenly kingdom together with those whom they have assisted and supported. We call this completion stage returning resurrection. So now we can understand from a new perspective the 11th chapter of Paul's letter to the Hebrews where he begins by describing, in the very first verse, he begins to describe all the righteous and faithful in history. He talks about Abel, how he was justified by his righteous action, and Noah, and Abraham, and Isaac, and he goes on all the way up to the current time. And then he says in the 39th verse, 
And all these, all these faithful ones, although well justified, although they were well att attended by their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God has foreseen for us something better. And apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Let's consider what this means. These individuals from the past who resurrect, Paul said, all these, although well attended, well attested by their faith, did not receive, go here. Paul said, all these, though well attested by their faith, did not receive what was promised. Now, all these refers to the saints of the Old Testament era. Well attested by their faith means they were righteous and pure. But they did not receive what was promised, meaning the full opportunity, the full testament. Promise means testament of now the New Testament era. The full promise of perfection. Since God has foreseen something better for us, meaning those of us in this age have a greater foundation, a greater merit, and can go to a higher level of resurrection. That apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Without us, they cannot realize their own goal of perfection and fulfilling the purpose of creation. Immediately after that, Paul testified about these saints and said, We are surrounded even now by so great a cloud of witnesses. They are around us even at this moment. Likewise, in the book of Jude, Behold, the Lord comes with His holy myriads, with the armies of heaven, vast armies of the spiritual realm, who attend the Lord at the time of His return. Now, let's consider returning resurrection for spirits who are not involved in the history of the Judeo-Christian foundation for the Messiah, outside of this realm of paradise. A spirit who believed in a religion other than Christianity during his lifetime, seeks a counterpart among the earthly people of the same religion as he believed during his earthly life. This is the key point, common base. How is it that someone can descend spiritually and connect with someone on earth? It's exactly the same way as you and I make relationships with people on earth when we have something in common when we can identify, make a common base, communicate, and connect. Similarly, those in the spiritual world can most easily identify with who? With whom could they most easily have a common base? With their descendants. That would mean physical descendants, and so many of you in this audience have experienced your departed ancestors communicating with you in dreams, or inspiring you, or you felt intuitively their presence but also spiritual descendants, those of the same faith perspective, those who see the world from the same insight. This is why in the many documented cases of people who've died clinically for 5 or 10 or 15 minutes and had experiences, those who were Christian may have seen, had an experience from a Christian perspective. Those who were Buddhist may have had an experience from a Buddhist perspective. So a spirit who believed in a religion other than Christianity during his lifetime, seeks a counterpart among the earthly people of the same religion as he believed during his earthly life. He descends to the person of his choice, the person with whom he or she can make a common base and then guides, inspires, and works with them. When he helps that person fulfill their portion of the, their purpose in the providence of restoration, then both receive the same benefit. What about a non-religious person? Good spirits who lived a conscientious life descend to good people on earth and cooperate with them. In the process, that these spirits receive the same benefits as the people that they have helped. Now what about malevolent or evil spirits? Are there such? Well, Jesus testified so. The Bible testifies so. Jesus often addressed people's physical diseases by casting out the spiritual influence or even address their psychological or mental struggles by removing an unclean spirit. Now, someone who lived a self-centered life, a life focused on sexual desire, 
or a life focused on alcohol or a life focused only on their own satisfaction. When they enter the spiritual world, in the same way as a righteous person may be longing to complete their purpose and their responsibility spiritually, that person may be obsessed by the desire of their body which now can no longer be satisfied unless they fulfill it through someone on earth. And so there are negative, malevolent, self-centered influences also spiritually. Now, in order for evil spirits to receive the benefit of this process of returning resurrection, their works must have the effect of punishing earthly people in conformity with God's plan to cleanse them of their sins. This doesn't mean that God sends evil spirits. It means that when a righteous person on earth confronts a temptation or a past barrier or an un unresolved ancestral issue that, con that affects his path on earth, when the person on earth overcomes, if he's overcome the trial and that evil or malevolent spiritual uh, uh, influence has participated in creating that difficulty and that test, his victory will also benefit the evil spirit. Now, of course, the works of evil spirits do not always bear fruit and result in their receiving the benefit of returning resurrection. There is a negative, self-centered, and destructive, and demonic spiritual world as well. Now, let's consider, based on this simple and brief overview, which I'm sure has generated a number of questions, let's consider the theory of reincarnation in light of this principle of returning resurrection. Spirits who could not complete their missions during their earthly life must return to people on earth who share the same type of mission as they had during their lifetime. Hence, when a spirit assists an earthly person to fulfill God's will, the earthly person will fulfill not only his or her own mission, but also the mission of the spirit who has helped him. From the standpoint of mission, the physical self of the physically living person concurrently serves as the body or the instrument, the physical self, of the discarnate spirit. In a sense, this earthly person is the second coming of the spirit through whom he can fulfill his un incomplete life desire. He may sometimes, this person on earth may sometimes feel that he is that person. He may be called by the spirit's name. He may be, appear to be the reincarnation of that spirit. John the Baptist, in fact, whom the Bible says came in the spirit and power of Elijah, actually ate, went to the wilderness ate locusts and wild honey, which Elijah had done nine, 900 years before. He wore camel skin, a belt of camel skin, which Elijah had done 900 years before. John was clearly influenced by and walking the path of and fulfilling the incomplete mission of Elijah. But he was not the reincarnation of Elijah. Elijah appeared from the spiritual world on the Mount of Transfiguration communicating with Jesus. In a similar sense, there is often misunderstanding of this phenomena. The doctrine of reincarnation interprets these outward phenomena without the benefit of knowing the principle of resurrection. Now finally, let's consider the impact of the descent of the spiritual world in the last days. The unification of religions through returning resurrection. First, the unification of Christianity through this process. At the time of the second advent, spirits will descend from paradise to assist believers on the earth. Each believer will be guided by them to go before Christ at the second advent, devoting their lives for the sake of God's will. See, it's for this reason that I strongly encourage you, if you have questions or concerns, if a point of this teaching is new or challenging for you, of course, get your questions answered. Contact our family federation and, and, and discuss, but also simply pray. For those of you who are faithful believers, ask the Lord for guidance. Ask Jesus to guide you. I have no doubt that if you have a living relationship with the Lord, that you'll receive that guidance. The problem is that so many believers, quote-unquote believers, and I, don't, I won't cr criticize any particular denomination, but so many of us are relating with doctrines that we've been taught, belief systems that we have inherited from generations of others' understanding, or, or church structures, or elders' boards, or uh, we're, we're, we're united with a denomination, but the problem is so few have a living and personal relationship with 
Christ. But I encourage you that if you have that relationship or seek that relationship, offer up in prayer any question about these things and you'll be guided to be sure. Because of this reason, because of the descent of the spiritual world, Christianity is destined to be united through the power of the Spirit. Next, the unification of religions through returning resurrection. Christ at the second advent is the central figure whose advent is expected in other religions as well. Actually, all of the world's major faith traditions are messianic in nature. For the Jewish people, the Messiah is still expected to come preceded by Elijah because the idea that Jesus fulfilled the Jewish uh, ideal of Messiahship is rejected by the Jews. So the Jews are waiting for the Messiah to come the first time. Uh, uh, Muslims, faithful Muslims, expect the Mahdi or the hidden Imam or even the return of Jesus which is described in Scripture that the, Jesus will return and the Quran affirms the, mess, the messianic role of Jesus, his birth without sin, the role of Mary, etc. And so many faithful Muslim believers are expecting the last day and a return in a similar sense. Buddhism speaks of the Maitreya, the Buddha of love. Buddha wrote of the Maitreya Buddha, the Buddha who would not just accomplish internally, but physically, substantially in the world be a true bodhisattva and accomplish the, the uh, practice love in the world. Uh, the, uh, Hinduism speaks that each era, each spiritual age is opened by an avatar, a spiritual leader who comes. The uh, Confucianism speaks of the man of truth. The world's greatest faiths have a messianic ideal at their heart and at their core. But will there be ten messiahs coming? One for each of the religions? One God, one Christ, one world. Spirits who resurrect first, the Bible says, the resurrection of the dead, the rising up of those who are in the spiritual realm is the first phenomenon in the last days, prior to those on earth coming to awareness. So these spirits will assist fellow believers on earth to believe in Christ at the second advent and support His work to fulfill God's will. Though the timing will vary based on each person's preparation, their spiritual standard, and their readiness, ultimately, all will be led. Accordingly, all religions eventually will be able to unite in harmony. Lastly, the unification of the non-religious through returning resurrection. Spirits who led a conscientious life in their lifetime but did not believe in a particular religion will also return to the earth at the granted time to receive the benefit of returning resurrection. They will guide conscientious earthly persons to seek out Christ at the second advent, attend Him, and assist Him in fulfilling God's will. These are some of the introductory principles of the providence of resurrection, which can give us a new understanding of the meaning of coming from death to life and rising again. Now, the age we're living in is a time when because it is the last days, because it is the time of Christ's return, we see the spiritual world descending in this time. For that reason, there is more and more intense activity taking place on the earth. Those who are living the way of righteousness will become more extreme in that direction. Those who are living unrighteous and self-centered and corrupted lives, there'll be a stronger and stronger division. The intensity of this time of the last days will increase and increase as the sheep and goats are separated because the spiritual world is active and this is the time of the fulfillment of the purpose and plan of history and the realization of God's purpose of creation. I hope that some of these principles have enlightened you. I look forward to meeting you next time. Thank you very much.